Uh, my name is Jane Lute. I'm a member of the board of the Center for Internet Security, and it's my privilege to welcome you here this morning uh, for the release of the seventh version, uh, Control 7.0. Um, it's something that um, a lot of people in this room know a lot about. And uh, my job this, after, or this morning is to welcome you, as I said, and to turn the floor over to Tony Sager. But before I do, um, I want to say a word about Tony and the work that he's done, um, not single-handedly anymore, uh, because he's had tremendous help from John Gilligan, Kurt Dukes, and uh, James, Kelly, and a number of you in this room, again, whom you know. Uh, but Tony has been the driving force behind the controls, uh, keeping it moving and keeping it developing always. And those of us who are here represent, I think, through our presence, our commitment to joining him in this effort. It's only through widespread adoption of basic cyber hygiene and the controls represents the finest example of that, that we're really going to change the game when it comes to cybersecurity. So Tony, uh, on behalf of all of us, let me thank you and offer you the floor. Well, after that introduction, I hate to correct Jane, but I will. I'm, I'm one of those uh, folks who has spent an entire career never doing anything by myself. So there's no, there's no project, no paper, no invention, nothing that I ever did that was on my own. So, so thank you all for coming in and welcome. Uh, thank you also uh, to our hosts here at uh, New America for, uh, you know, we, part of this project is all the great friends and partners and colleagues that we made along the way. So we really appreciate that. So, and I'm, I'm particularly thrilled, and I'm not kidding when I say thrilled, to introduce uh, version seven of the CIS controls to everybody here. Because I was there on day zero. And day zero was a handful of friends sitting around a table, literally a handful of friends, and thinking about the problem of how do we help people improve themselves in cybersecurity. And uh, at that time, and I spent 35 years at the National Security Agency, uh, all of it in defense, and all of it in security testing. And what was really starting to bug me was, um, hey, security testing is great work, right? Penetration testing, red teaming, finding zero days. It is amazing work. It draws great people, it's great fun, it's full of clever ideas, and the best part is, at least the way we did it traditionally, you had no responsibility to fix anything, right? <laughs> that is like great work. But after, you know, I spent probably a, a third of my career kind of learning the craft, and there was no better place at that time in history than the National Security Agency. The middle third of my career uh, moving into management jobs, which is often considered punishment at NSA, and then the last third, thinking about what in the world is going on out there? Why are we seeing the same problems over and over again? Why are highly sensitive systems being undone by what seem to be pretty uninteresting, mundane problems? Is it because people don't care? Are they lazy? Or where are we failing? Well, my experience in dealing with operators across the entire DOD and intelligence community and lots of the uh, private sector, there's a lot of great people out there, but they're overwhelmed. The problem was not the lack of tools and technology and training and resources and attention and professionalism. It's that everyone's overwhelmed by the job, right? We've gone from a world that I grew up in where we conceptually only had one enemy. Anyone remember those quaint days? To where everybody is your friend and your adversary and your rival at the same time on the same network using the same technology. It's a really different problem. And so the opportunity was there to think differently about defense. And um, I led a campaign in uh, about 2001 to release the NSA security guidance to the public. That brought us a lot of attention, a lot of great feedback, and was really a, intended to be a message about the role that NSA should play, and the government should play, in helping everyone defend themselves. And uh, when you put something out there, you get a lot of feedback and a lot of great questions, and people would say things, and some of you who are in the audience would say, that's great information, thank you, but where do I start? Wh what do you mean? Where do I start? I can only keep my boss's attention on three things. I can only afford to do two things. What should I do in the next month, next quarter? Where should I spend my first dollar? So I can tell you, I never had responsibility for that because I never thought of that question, to be honest. So I thought, you know what, that's for real. That makes sense, right? If you're gonna solve a problem, you have to start. And it's overwhelming to try and figure out where to begin. So a, a handful of people in the room, and the challenge was this. Let's come up with a small number of things that we think all of our friends should do. Not to solve world hunger, because you get enough security people in the room and you know what happens, right? You come up with these thousand action item lists, 
these gigantic, incredibly impressive, unusable catalogs of things to do. It's overwhelming. So people, you know, again, this business is full of really clever people. And so they come up with these great ideas and they are professionally trained to poke holes in every idea that you have. So it's not surprising you get these giant lists. So I said, small number. Small to me meant five to seven. Human beings who work at NSA being what they are, they wouldn't uh, agree <laughs> to less than 10. And a two-page letter or so left NSA to a few friends, to the CIO of the Air Force, to the Joint Staff, and a few friends like that. It was just another afternoon's project. I would love to tell you that I had this grand vision that was gonna bring us to here today, right? Uh, a worldwide community, effect across the entire industry, uh, un uncountable number of supporters, volunteers, but I did not. I wasn't that clever. It was a two-page letter. It was an afternoon's work. It was one of dozens of things that we were doing. And uh, a few weeks later, uh, a dear friend, the late Paul Bartok, who worked with me at NSA, just one of the unsung heroes of this business, he leans into my doorway, looks in, and says, I just got a phone call from Alan Paller of Sands. They have our list. And he wants to know, can you can he take this list and build a project around it? And I said, of course, can't stop him. And we put it out to be unclassified, right? There's nothing sensitive about this. Well, um, one thing led to another, and the role of uh, CSIS, the Center for Strate Strategic and International Studies here in DC, the Sands Institute, John Gilligan, as a project leader, created the essential format of what we know today as the CIS controls. All right, so we had, um, and it went from you know, five friends in a room conceptually to 5,000 friends on a mailing list, right? A big community. Uh, if you've worked with the Sands Institute, you know that they're not capable of doing anything at small scale, so it's gotta be big. So it was big, and it built the notion of a community contributing to this common good, right? This idea is a really important idea. It's to recognize, not just in a you know, rah-rah kind of a way, but we're all in this together. Right, we're all connected, using the same technology, facing the same kinds of problems. Yeah, everyone's got something to worry about, but if we treat every enterprise in the industry as the special snowflake, right, your problem's so unique, you couldn't possibly do anything till you figure out all the threats and all the attacks, then we're paralyzed forever. And to recognize that we actually have more in common than we do that's different. And so, so let's take action, right? Let's share ideas, resources. None of us has enough trained people to deal with this problem on our own. None, none of us has enough technology. None of us has access to enough information. So that simple idea of five friends talking turns into a big idea. So you've heard uh, some of the earlier names for the project, the uh, consensus audit guidelines. It's kind of a popular name of the SANS top 20 for a while. So fast forward, I retired in 2012 from NSA, went to work to do some special projects at SANS, took this back over. And uh, with the uh, grace and support of SANS, spun it out into a nonprofit, and here we are today as part of the Center for Internet Security, really an, uh, super institution that is the perfect home for the kinds of things that we're trying to do here today. And what I will remind everybody and what we're gonna see today, so, so five friends, two pages, to an incredible industry-wide, worldwide community that creates this. And uh, believe me, there is no giant think tank that is um, CIS, right? You're, most of the staff is right here that works on this project, is right here in this room, and not many of them. It's really about volunteerism. Right? We are a mechanism to bring together the talent across this industry, focus on the problem that we have in common, think about the potential solutions to that problem, create and sustain products that will allow everyone to deal with it at some level, and then distribute them as widely, as freely as we can, okay? and still have a viable uh, company. That's the big idea that really drives me every day and the way we think about this. So, and it's, and it's, not a, it's never been about is our list of 20 better than their list of 10, better than the catalog that's over here? That is not it, right? If you want a great list, you can go to any virtual street corner in this business, right? Lots of places, government agencies, magazine articles, uh, different nonprofits, there, there are lists everywhere. And if you look at them carefully, at some level of abstraction, they're 80, 90% the same, right? Some are cosmic and, and highfalutin, and some are very granular and super specific, but there really is not much difference and so to me, that was another great lesson. Well then, why don't we share our labor up front? Why don't we figure this out together? And so that's what we're really about. And the sustainment of the uh, idea is a really important one also, right? I've been around this for 40 plus years now, seen many great ideas in computer security, information security, comsec, et cetera, et cetera, fall by the wayside because no one planned to sustain it over time, right? You come up with a great idea, great paper, great list, great tool, 
Is it going to be there in a year, two, five years from now when you really need it? Okay. You have to create a mechanism to manage this through time. So that's really what CIS is all about. We are the, the home of this kind of work. We are made powerful not by what we do, but by our ability to corral all the talent that's out there. That's one of the great un unappreciated aspects of this business. It's full of really talented, clever people, right? Representatives uh, in this room. But they're also people of goodwill that really believe there's something bigger than all of us here. And so well, there'll be great examples of that. So welcome to version seven. So much, so starting in version seven, we really, or starting six, I'm pardon, uh, October 2015, we really started, uh, I'll call it the formalization of the infrastructure of the controls. So it went from me sitting in a room with a cat and a dog and a cup of coffee all day to really the mechanism that's here today, right? The sustainment through CIS. Uh, we just passed 100,000 downloads of version six. An incredible uh, achievement for all of us here. And we now have more, uh, for version seven, we have more feedback than ever, managed more uh, cleverly, much more people involved in the documents themselves. And what's happened, again, it's not about the list, right? A whole ecosystem has started to develop around the controls. It's not just the document, it's not just the adopters, but the support from industry, the creation of new content that's coming into our world, our work with uh, different industries from power generation to, you know, sort of all these verticals that have uh, latched onto the controls of something important. And we're also very conscious of our role in the ecosystem, right? We're, we're not, you know, we have no government authority. We have no uh, legislative power. We have power that people like you grant us, right, that choose to do what we do. We are uh, founded in this framework. You know, we're aligned with all the different things that are out there. We'll help you. Uh, we, we are now entering what I call the multi-framework world. Our surveys, and I think your, your experience will tell you, right, it, it, you're a lucky enterprise if you only have to deal with one set of uh, eyes looking over your shoulder. Most now are in the two, three, four, or five or more regulatory, you know, geographic oriented, you know, industry specific. Uh, everyone wants to know what you're doing. And you cannot afford to spend 80% of your time and money proving to others you've done the right thing. You really want to spend that on doing the right thing. Right, we need to prove to others that we've done the right thing in the most cost-efficient way possible. So that's the role that we play here. So the agenda today, uh, it'll be quick because it's not about the event even or even the tasty snacks out there. Um, uh, Phil Langwall will talk to you a little bit about the uh, process that we use. We'll have some discussion about sort of behind the scenes, some of the key issues that we we're trying to deal with in version 7. We have one of our flagship adopters to, to talk about what's happening in the state of Virginia. And then we'll have a panel to talk about some of the key issues and questions that you might have. So think of this as the start of a conversation for the future versions of the controls. You know, I always tell people, I don't have a priority list, right? Our priorities are driven by the community's needs. And we get that because people talk to us. And we're out there trying to figure out what the need is. What do we have in common? What can we create that will help you? And how do we build a community that will uh, create, sustain that over time? So with that, I'm going to bring up uh, Phil. I wouldn't even joke about how better organized Phil has been in doing version seven than I was with six. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, good morning. So I hope everyone has their, uh, their coffee because we're going to go through the control one by one for the next hour and a half. All right. Um, no, all joking aside, uh, my name is Philip Langua. I'm the uh, technical control product manager um, for the CIS controls. This is kind of my first experience in terms of developing the, the controls content. And it's been an amazing experience, not because the content is really well written, but because the process is very innovative. I think it's, it's a very unique process and depends heavily upon the volunteers that we use and rely upon. And that's kind of the core part of the CIS mission is leveraging this army of volunteers to help us create this guidance for everyone. The idea is let us raise all ships. Let us work together to address similar problems that we're all facing on a regular basis. You know, problems like how do we deal with cloud infrastructure? You know, I'm a small, medium business. How do I implement cybersecurity with limited resources or expertise? I don't know the controls. What are the privacy implications? Uh, I'm interested in terms of how I can manage my risks. What's the process I need to help kind of manage different expectations from businesses? So instead of each of us coming together with our own answer, let's bring in the expertise and let's collectively come up with an answer. You know, it may not be the best answer, may not be applicable to everyone, but at least let's get 90% of the way there. And we can only do that through the great volunteers we have within our community. So let me go a little bit in terms of the process that we went through. So we started with some very core principles we wanted to apply for version seven. The biggest part was we wanted to simplify the language. 
We want to make it easier for everyone to know when they achieved a specific subcontrol. So we did a first cut. We call that our simplified version. James and Kelly were really kind of the, the large and main editors that really kind of helped provide that structure. And we started from there. You know what? It took us a few months back and forth. We felt really good about it. Like, awesome. We're going to start bringing in some more community members. You know, we've got friends and family. Um, so we created an online collaboration website that we've used for, work, uh, for benchmarks for many, many years. We brought our friends and family on there. Group of 73. So we went over another two, three months by control by control. Wow, we got a really good thing going. We you know, feel really confident. Let's open it up. So then we opened it up to, I think we emailed 81,000 people or something like that about the controls. And then we were able to get more feedback. So our little community of 75 people grew almost overnight to over 200. And as part of version 7, we had to integrate over 600 individual recommendations. I mean, we tried as much as we could to address them. Um, you know, we're, like Tony mentioned, we're, we're a small staff, but we're really supplemented by a large army of volunteers uh, spanning the globe, including some friends in uh, New Zealand. I know they'd start because their mornings are when we're done at night, so you know, when his comments started coming around. But we were able to go and really create, I think, a, a much better um, document. And I think this is something that we're, we're all very proud of and we're going to help grow. And this is really just a step one for us. This is part of a new process. This is a new experience for us, and we're going to keep building upon it. So we're going to be looking as part of version 7 to roll out additional communities to start addressing some of these difficult problems that we're all facing. Um, and this is going to only be done through volunteers within our organization um, and other organizations around. So if you're you know, an expert, or you think you're an expert, or you want to learn more about cybersecurity, absolutely feel free to join one of our communities. You know, there, there's, no, there's no threshold in terms of expertise to come in and contribute. Also, if you're a manager and you have staff that want to grow and they want to learn, encourage them and also give them the opportunities to participate within our communities. Um, this is really to benefit everyone. We give back pretty much everything we write up and everything we do to our community. Um, so this is uh, actually more or less my time already. But once again, you know, this is really, okay. Uh, so one of the other things I just kind of want to touch up on that we didn't get a chance to as part of the initial was some of the core principles. So I mentioned two of them from the onset, which was the simplification of the language, being more concise with it. You know, the controls have gone through a lot of revisions and they've, they've grown over the years. And you actually have a chart that has every single control mapped out. And I'll, you know, you notice when the language was added, when there's a specific new edge case, like, okay, let's add this language. Let's add this concept. Um, so we've done kind of what I like to call a controlled brush fire. Um, so we've burned a lot of the explanatory language where we have a really the core language and the core requirements set down. Um, as part of that, since now we have a core requirements identified, it's easier to work with measures and metrics to really know when you're achieving a specific subcontrol. Because now there's one ask for subcontrol. The language is very prescriptive. It tells you exactly where you can find the information. Um, so we're really focused more in terms of providing a way to have objective measures to know whether or not you're achieving the specific subcontrols. Um, part of it is we're also looking at more of a collaborative environment. You know, we want to have more controls, more communities. This is, once again, this is really our step one and our first, uh, our first take at this. I have to just double check what the other ones are because I don't have them memorized, unfortunately. My apologies. But the, uh, oh yeah, and this is really a big one. The, there's a big structural change we did. So everyone who's got the fact sheet right now will notice that we don't have a wheel anymore. Uh, we've kind of broken it down into three major categories. The basic, the foundational, and the organizational. And part of that is we wanted to help, once again, prioritize organizations' efforts in implementing the controls. And we've always said the first five controls, and now it's the first five and six, we're kind of part of this first step organizations really need to take because if you don't have that down, you're going to have a large amount of difficulty implementing the rest of the controls. And the foundational, these are the practices that we recommend every organization do. And the organizational controls are much more um, non-technical in their nature, and they provide a little bit more um, kind of higher level guidance. We're not necessarily the experts in terms of these controls. We really focus in, in terms of pointing direction as to where can organizations get better guidance for these last controls. And we're hopefully going to be building off of that within the future into maybe additional guidance. Um, we're very flexible. We're, we're very driven by our volunteers. So the direction and what 
you guys need within your implementation, and we will take that seriously to heart. And we're very happy to kind of help build and address these complex problems. So I'm gonna pass it back to you, Tony. Thanks, Bill. He, and he understates the, the kind of intensity of the discussions that go on <laughs> during all these things. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, the visual that we're now using. I'm sorry, I missed that, uh, uh, putting that up when I was there. And uh, as Bill talked about, you know, it's a complicated business, right? Lots of opinions coming together in an in a, uh, industry that's full of opinionated people. So part of the job of CS is reminding us all of this uh, common problem that we have. And we don't operate like the IEEE. We don't operate, you know, with... We, we uh, consensus to me means that everyone gets to leave the room that we're gonna support the outcome, but we're probably unhappy that some pet rock of ours did not make it onto the table. And that's a fair thing, right? Again, in this industry, it's easy to come up with lists of thousands of things to do. We are trained to do that. The difficulty is always in cutting back, right? Prioritizing, because that's the challenge that folks like you face, and that's the challenge that we really started with. Uh, last point to, to echo on Phil's is that, as he said, we're a lot of what we did this time was setting the foundation for future generations of the controls, right? Less sort of uh, wordy narrative stuff, uh, more clarity so that we know what to test, so that we can point to technologies, so that we can build automated mappings to other frameworks and tools and workflows and things like that. So we're really excited that there's a lot of great under the hood uh, changes also here. And uh, next up, I'll bring uh, James Tarala from Enclave Security, who was also one of our editors here. So hi there, my name is James Trolla and I've had an opportunity over the last 10 years or so to participate in the project and it's been great. It's been an awesome opportunity to work with folks like Tony and Phil and Kelly and others to, to see where the controls have come over the last 10 years and one of the, one of the great opportunities I've had has been not only working with CIS but um, spending a great deal of time with the SANS Institute. And where a lot of my time actually ends up getting spent is with people who are actually doing these implementations. And whether it be us assessing organizations or actually sitting with organizations trying to answer questions, the, the thing we've observed over the last 10 years or so has just been to watch the evolution of the document itself. And, and it's, it's been interesting because every version we see that gets released, it feels like it's just that much better than what was before. And you know, whether it been version two or three or where we are now, there's always a little bit of cringing, I think, on our part, sort of being the, the people writing words and putting the actual words on paper. And, and we see some of the things that get written. And I, I have to say, I know every version we say this, but I really feel like with the version seven release, some of those things that maybe nagged at us or that we just weren't quite sure of in previous versions really has cleaned up. It really feels like, uh, as Phil was saying, that things have gotten to a place of stability uh, and it's hopefully going to be that much easier for organizations to implement the clear guidance that, that's been released. Uh, as we look at the documentation itself, uh, one of the things I know that's been brought up already is this idea of this one ask concept. One of the things as we look at the content, if, if I could give maybe just a couple of pieces of overview of some of the things we wanted to focus on at this, this latest release, was this one ask concept. Uh, not just for the sake of just clarity or one ask, I mean there certainly was this clarity aspect. I know a lot of times in talking to organizations, you say, well, okay, you say in this control that we should ad address devices, but you say in this other control that we should deal with systems, and in this other control we should deal with assets. What's, what's the difference? What's the difference between a device and an asset and a system? And you know, having to wrestle with those kind of things and try to bring clarity to the language. So I think a big part of what we tried to accomplish in this version was just simply to bring that clarity and that understanding, make it simple. One of the things I worry about is when we read these compliance and these regulatory guides, that there has to be a lot of times almost an interpreter, that, that you have to find that wizard that can meet with you, interpret what does this phrase really mean. And, and, and I think one of the things we really tried to work hard on in this version was trying to remove that need for an interpreter, that it should be clear enough by itself to explain what that means. Now, that was certainly a big part of it, and, and I would certainly say if you have opportunity and you have a chance to look a little deeper into the controls, a couple of things I would maybe have you look at, look at the statements themselves, Look at the measures and the new measure guide that was released with the current version. Uh, again, I feel like this is something that's come light years from where we were in version six. Um, not only is it a one ask per control, but it's one measure per control. And I think what you're gonna see more and more is that those measures hopefully will be even that much easier to automate and build into more technical components, dashboards and such that organizations can use to track this risk over time. 
The other thing I guess that I would highlight as you're looking at the new version, uh, one of the things I know is, is the, the transition was made as, as SANS sort of uh, handed over some of the documentation, as Tony had mentioned earlier, uh, as CIS took responsibility for the, the future development of the controls. I remember one of the things that, that Alan Pollard said sort of always sticks in my mind is he said to a group of us just standing in a hallway, when you release new versions, he said, don't be afraid to ask for the things that are hard. And, and I remember him saying that over and over again. And he said there's going to be a lot of things that come out uh, that you want to put into these documents that, that aren't going to be easy or that there might not be a technical solution for today. But don't be afraid to ask for those if you really feel like that's going to make a difference for the community going forward. And I think one of the, the focuses that you're going to see in this version of the controls is around that idea of a couple things that may be considered, well, frankly, just a little bit hard, but helpful overall to cybersecurity efforts. Uh, certainly, you see all of the structural changes we've made. And if you were to ask, you know, are there giant changes, brand new controls that we're asking for in this version that just weren't there a year ago? I don't know that there are. But I think we've clarified the language and we've clarified a couple specific asks. In fact, if I could draw your attention to just a couple, the couple of the ones that I would probably focus on the most, um, number one would be application whitelisting. Uh, application whitelisting has been there for, for quite some time. This is not a new control. It's not something that is sort of new to everyone's radar. Um, certainly, you can go back to other studies beyond this, look at what the Australians have released in their essential aid and others over the years. Uh, certainly, you're not the only ones to talk about this particular control. But I think one of the things you'll see in version 7 is more clarity around what that actually means. Uh, not only are we asking specifically for things like application binaries to be addressed, uh, but you're going to see some specific language around uh, application libraries, uh, DLLs, OCXs, things like this, um, having more detail around there. Uh, more and more conversation about scripting languages. I know more and more organizations are seeing attacks looking at PowerShell-oriented attacks and those sorts of issues. Um, you'll see a number of controls specifically addressing uh, not only whitelisting of application binaries, but of scripts, uh, code signing related to those scripts, and some of the defenses PowerShell has to offer, um, specifically because of those threats we've observed. The other area that I'd have you probably focus on as well would be multi-factor authentication. That's been an area that I know has been in the controls for a number of years. Again, this is not a new thing. Uh, one of the debates that we had quite a bit as we looked at this current version was, um, even back as far as version 6 and 6.1, you probably remember seeing some of those statements around multi-factor. And there's almost this, um, uh, this, this split personality within the controls. We sort of said to everyone, we want you to do multi-factor, we know it's the right thing to do, but we also know it's hard. And, and we don't expect everyone to be able to do that right away. And it seems like slowly over the last probably three years or so, we've been uh, maybe turning up the temperature of the water just a little bit, getting everybody used to the idea that this is where we're coming from. And what we wanted to do is make you, make you aware of the control and in version 7 now, hopefully what we've done is we've started to eliminate some of those conversations about passwords. I know there's a lot of really good guidance out there right now. I know 800-63 has been very popular, and uh, NIST has had some really good conversations around that and what password strength really means. But I, I like what we've done with version 7 as far as specifically looking at multi-factor from a lot of different angles, not just from an end user standpoint, um, but from what we're seeing on the administrator side, certainly corresponding what you're seeing with the state of New York, the state of Connecticut, uh, PCI 3.2. Uh, a lot of that sort of is correlating now at this point. Um, you're seeing it for remote users. You're seeing it for service accounts being mentioned, um, computers joining a network, those sort of things. So I think you're seeing a lot more focus on those areas as well. So I think those would be two areas I would probably point out immediately uh, to have everybody take a couple minutes, uh, make sure you look at those technical controls. The other thing and the last thing I'd have you look at as you're looking at just some of the content changes is the use of quality management programs. I, I know uh, we have practice aids that you'll see released here over the coming months as we uh, have more opportunity to talk about what this really means. But one of the th changes we wanted to make with this new release was the outcome of the measures themselves. We talk about one ask per control, which again, you're, you're going to hear a lot of us talk about today. But we have one ask per control. We have one measure per ask or per control. And that leads to a very specific set of measurements. In fact, if you look at data types and the way the measurements will take place, uh, you'll see two primary measures we're going to make. Boolean, in other words, are you doing something good, yes or no, right, sort of this true-false statement. And then pretty much every other measure will be a percent-based measure. And that wasn't by accident. Uh, one of the things we tried to integrate more with was quality management. And you're going to see a lot of references to Six Sigma and some of the practice aids uh, looking at maturity levels. Uh, one of the things you're going to see again over the coming months will be again this idea of tools uh, and some of the different toolkits we have in practice aids around measurement 
and maturity levels specifically. So I, I just want to draw your attention to these. I mean, certainly I, I expect that everyone's going to take some time and look through the document itself. But these were some of the, I think, the core changes, maybe some of the harder changes that I want you to be aware of. Uh, a lot of the spirit of the controls has been consistent. I think one of the things you've seen from Tony since the, the very early days is that there's a certain consistency. And I don't expect when version 10 comes out that you're going to see a wholesale you know, rewrite of the controls. But there are certain hygiene concepts that keep coming out over and over again. And there's just more and more refinement of those in those current versions. So again, hopefully that's a useful tool to everybody. And we're looking forward to more feedback for the future releases as well. James, a little bit of uh, inside baseball into how we uh, come out with a finished product, but also the, the last point James made about measurement and so forth. You know, we have, since starting with version 6, we're now collecting lots more feedback about how people use the controls, how the industry supports the controls, right? Again, it's not about the list. What we're doing is putting in place a lot of content, uh, measurement, infrastructure. Th these, are, these kinds of tools are really decision support tools, right? How do we make company decisions or mission decisions and that the challenge for us in the future in cyber is about putting what the expertise that we all have into decision-making frameworks, not trying to impress people with how clever we are, right, that we can come up with lists of things to do. So that's uh, a little bit of what's going on there. I mentioned CIS has been uh, just a super home for the work here, and I'm really pleased to be part of the team at, at CIS. One thing that really <laughs> distinguishes uh, CIS in this space is that we also have an operational mission. We are also the home of the multi-state ISAC, right, the Information Sharing and Analysis Center, for state and local governments in the U.S. So uh, when we brought all this together, see, when I, when I ran those operations at NSA, and we were uh, giving to the public NSA security guides and all this great content, I had pretty high confidence in what was coming out of there because we had an operational mission. The red teams, the blue teams, right, the people seeing and living and cleaning up after problems every day. And that really brings a certain perspective to the content that you create, right? It makes you much more conscious of the trade-offs between sort of pure security and, and supporting operations. And, and, you know, I always just say, when we make a mistake in the NSA security guide, I get a phone call from a multi-star human being who's not in a happy mood because <laughs> we brought something down that we did not intend to bring down. And that did happen more than once. Um, so, so being part of a CIS also gives us this role with the state uh, you know, with the, with the nation across state, local, tribal, territorial entities. And so, so um, that also gives us kind of a natural customer base. So I'm going to uh, uh, please to bring up to the uh, podium Kathy Bortle from the state of Virginia, one of our flagship adopters, and she'll talk a little bit about the, the way that uh, Virginia sees the controls and how they're using them uh, in the management of their enterprises. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to thank CIS for um, allowing me to come here and share the Commonwealth of Virginia's experience implementing the CIS critical controls. Um, so let's start at the beginning. In 2003, legislation was passed that created Virginia as a centralized IT organization for the Commonwealth. As part of this legislation, VITA was given responsibility not only for IT governance, but also for providing infrastructure services for executive branch agencies. This can be thought of as, as taking 80 individual companies and trying to merge them together into one. How in the world was Vita ever going to provide infrastructure services when each agency had been going their own direction for years? Um, the agencies would not take well if we just dictated the change to them, but somehow we had to merge them. In order to get our hands around this new environment, we needed to learn the business needs of all of our customer agencies and the citizens that they served. During meetings with the agencies, Vita learned that they had a different variety of hardware and software at each one of them. In addition, everybody had their own special configurations to meet their business needs. In 2006, Vita published the first version of the Commonwealth of Virginia IT security standard. This standard was based on uh, best practices so that the agencies would have a common framework to use to secure their systems and their data. Using the information we gathered from the agencies, we developed an asset management system that would record the hardware, software, and maintenance agreements being used across the Commonwealth. The implementation of this system allowed us to complete the first two CIS critical controls, the inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices and software. 
In 2008, we published our IT system security guideline. This document provides guidance for agencies to use in creating their security baselines for their systems, referencing NIST and the CIS benchmarks as examples of baselines that they could leverage. Over the next four years, VITA worked with agencies to get them transitioned into a homogeneous infrastructure. By 2012, the majority of executive branch agencies had been connected to the COV Enterprise Network. Providing an enterprise network meant that we could put enterprise level security controls in place using a defense in depth approach. This can be thought of as um, the layers of an onion, where the um, layers are trying to protect the core of its, of its purpose for, from any outside threats. So let's start at our boundary levels and see what Virginia did. Our boundary defenses are provided through firewalls, IDS and IPS, email and web security gateways, and secure VPN devices. Enterprise firewalls are configured to filter unauthorized traffic and create a separate DMZ and secure zone that segments six systems and applications based on the principle of least privilege. Email messages are scanned for malware and spam before being delivered to the enterprise mail system. Remote access is provided by utilizing the VPN with multi-factor authentication and posture assessment. As we pull back the layers of the onion, we find the network layer next. Let's take a look at what protections we implemented at this layer. Network Defense added web proxy filtering to block access to no malicious sites and examine web traffic for malicious payloads. Our wireless networks are configured to utilize multi-factor authentication for access. Policies were updated to require all unused network ports to be disabled by default and to only allow one connection per port. Now when we move to the next layer, we encounter the internal network. This is where our mission critical assets and data reside. So let's examine the multiple types of defenses that we need to apply to these resources to protect the crown jewels. Our first type of defense will be endpoint protection. Our endpoint defenses are applied not only to the endpoint devices, but also to our servers as well. So it, it covers the servers and the users. Antivirus, host-based intrusion protection, and threat intelligence software is installed. Web browsers are configured to use a web proxy to send all traffic through the web proxy. Any files the user downloads are automatically scanned for malware before they're presented to them. And email clients are configured to scan messages for malware before sending or receiving them. Endpoint devices receive monthly vulnerability scans to identify missing patches and configuration errors. These devices receive software updates through a centralized patch management system and receive configuration updates via central policy management servers to keep them in compliance with the Commonwealth security baselines. Okay, now that we have secured our devices, let's take a look at our applications. Application software defenses include web application firewalls and application control. The web application firewall serves to protect connections to applications and associated databases by monitoring the traffic for security flaws or malicious content such as SQL injection and cross-site scripting. The application control client is a required control for any device running end-of-life software. This control offers the agency an additional layer of protection by only permitting authorized applications to execute. I believe this is what um, James was referring to with the application whitelisting. Okay, now how do we put this all together to meet our legislative mandate of providing governance and infrastructure services? In order to fulfill its requirements to provide governance, VITA provides the policy standards and guidelines for how the Commonwealth's IT security program will function. These documents are reviewed and updated on an annual basis to adjust defenses and controls based on the current threat landscape. Some examples of the types of controls mandated include access grant on the principle of least privilege, administrative credentials must be approved by the agency head and must be provisioned through a separate account. Remote access to sensitive data requires two-factor authentication 
and sensitive systems must be audited once every three years. The COV IT security standard details data production requirements. VITA worked with the agencies to define data classification, data owner, and data custodian for the data sets that each agency utilizes. The standard mandates that sensitive data be encrypted at rest and only accessed remotely using multi-factor authentication. Our data is backed up at specific intervals determined by the criticality of the data that needs to be protected and the maximum recovery time before mission essential functions will be impacted by an event. In order to maintain secure infrastructure services, IT security operations provides the day-to-day -day monitoring of the log files being received by the SIM. They investigate any events that fall outside of normal activity, perform incident response, vulnerability scan, and forensics analysis, and maintains a situational awareness on the changing threat landscape so that defenses can be adjusted as needed to maintain the security posture of the Commonwealth's enterprise IT environment. When a spike in incidents is detected, the incidents are examined to determine the security control that failed, allowing the attack to be successful. How has the Commonwealth benefited from implementing the controls? In 2013, after a spike in malware incidents, VITA identified that many users were using their administrative accounts for routine access. As a result, we launched a project to reduce the number of accounts with local administrative rights. As soon as we got through the project and had reduced the number of accounts out there, we saw the malware incidents dropped, but then malware still stayed our number one attack vector. So we took a number of those infected devices and ran them through forensics analysis to figure out what was happening. And what we determined was that the malware was exploiting a number of known vulnerabilities in Java. As a, as a result, we launched another project to update Java on a quarterly basis. But it wasn't as simple as pushing the patches through our patch management system because our agencies all use different versions with different applications. So what we did was we um, worked with the agencies to test their applications with the new versions of Java. For things that would not work with the new version of Java, we had to look for alternate solutions for them. Um, we also worked with them to get the old end of life Java off of their um, devices. Because even though they would get new patches, there was no mechanism in place to remove the old version. Um, so we addressed that as well. Once we got through patching um, Java, we set up a pilot group in every agency so that as new versions are released, they will pilot it, test it, and then we'll push it out once a quarter. After we started pushing out Java updates quarterly, our number of malware incidents continued to drop and has remained low since then. In 2016, Vita determined that the majority of attack traffic was targeting our web applications. While Vita had set up a web application scanning service back in 2013, most of the agencies didn't have funding to take advantage of it. So we went to our legislature and asked them if we could provide this service to the executive branch agencies for free and they agreed. So the revised service was, went live the fourth quarter of 2016. VITA now performs quarterly web application vulnerability scans on 1,408 URLs. The first round of scans identified 30,614 findings of which 10% were considered high risk. This was a, a good indication of how vulnerable our web applications actually were. VITA worked diligently with agencies to remediate these findings, and the second set of scans saw an 18% reduction in the overall findings and 23% reduction in high findings. In today's environment, VITA has found that the greatest risk is the employees or the insider threat. Our employees are required to take security awareness training every year, however, this is not always sufficient. So as a result, 
We have um, set up customized simulated fishing campaigns to assist agencies with educating their employees against fishing attacks. Agencies are seeing a drop in the number of users that respond to the simulated fishing messages with each succeeding campaign. After a long journey implementing the CIS controls, the Commonwealth now has a mature IT security program that leverages defense in depth, provides granular insight into the environment, and facilitates a quick response to the changing threat landscape. All right, thanks very much, uh, Kathy, I appreciate that. Okay, next up, um, we're going to have a, a quick discussion panel hosted by my friend Kurt Dukes, a longstanding uh, professional friend, colleague, and a fellow bike rider. And we'll be joined by Greg Johnson from the Federal Reserve, Chris Cronin from Haylock Security Labs, and Kelly Tarala from Enclave Security. Come on up. Yep. Okay, as uh, Tony indicated, Kurt Dukes, uh, former um, NSA a senior senior official there, uh, spent 33 years in information assurance and cyber defense, and um, blessed to be able to come to the Center for Internet Security for two reasons. The first one really is around um, security benchmarks. Um, you know, at NS, while I was at NSA, we actually came up with this concept of a secure configuration for that. It's now homed uh, at the Center for Internet Security. And then the second, um, uh, opportunity was around um, the critical controls um, and again what we were trying to do at that point in time was try to disrupt the attackers life cycle uh, founded at, at NSA and has since transitioned to uh, to the Center for Internet Security for that so what I thought I'd do is maybe uh, allow each uh, panelist to a brief introduction um, and uh, uh, what organization you represent and maybe just uh, a short sentence around uh, why the control what the controls mean to you so first Greg uh, so good morning I'm Greg Johnson Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Um, my, in my role, we, um, we provide IT audit uh, assurance to uh, basically uh, the, anything that's been consolidated um, across the Fed, you know, based on, based on risk. So the, you know, the, the, the big financial systems that the Fed supports, um, you know, we provide a con really con a consolidated assurance kind of uh, services for, for that infrastructure. Um, we have been uh, leveraging um, our assurance framework using the CIS controls for about six years now. Uh, I think it's probably good for it. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Tarala. Yes, James and I uh, have the same last name. We're married. Uh, <laughs> I work with Enclave Security. I've been working with the controls for about 10 years now, and uh, I've had the opportunity to work with SAMS. James and I write courseware together, uh, helping folks understand the importance of the controls, how to implement them, and also how to tie them into their strategic programs and their, their governance programs. Chris? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Chris Cronin. I'm a partner at Haylock Security Lab. Uh, Haylock is a, a, a Chicago-based information security organization that helps organizations uh, uh, get, uh, get their security controls in line. Uh, respond to incidents and, uh, and help uh, represent their regulatory and, and uh, um, sometimes judicial needs. Uh, we'll use the uh, consensus, ooh, consensus audit guidelines. <laughs> wow, that goes back. <laughs> the critical security controls, the uh, controls version seven, we can go through the entire history. Uh, I, I worked with uh, James and Eric Cole to uh, uh, build some of the original courseware with the SANS Institute for consensus audit guidelines, now controls version seven. So uh, yeah, good to be here. Yep. Tony? Tony, you've heard enough from me. <laughs> yep. Perfect. So um, what I thought I would do is I start off with one question for each panelist, and then we'll take a, a brief pause and see what uh, questions we may have online, and then we'll follow up with additional questions from the moderator. So uh, first question goes to Greg. Um, so Greg, what drew you to the CIS controls in the first place? You know, the, the, the conversation around what, what, do you, what do you do? What do you do about cyber? So, you know, um, organizations were asking that question, and then you know the, the auditors were asking the question: what, what do we do about cybersecurity assurance work? And so, um, you know, really, I just sitting here looking at James. Uh, probably six years ago, I uh, went to the SANS class that, that he teaches, and uh, really to evaluate how applicable um, such an approach might be um, in doing our assurance work. And uh, boy, I, I just came back. Uh, 
uh, just really, really enthusiastic about. You know, here is a prioritized way to you know, provide cybersecurity audit coverage. Um, and then, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily expecting this to be a, a benefit, but um, it, it really helped us in conversations with management so we could actually rationalize, you know, here, here's what we're doing and why, instead of, you know, the, the typical audit, well, you know, we're looking at, at 300 controls and, you know, we, we can't really explain why, but we, we, we have to and, and all this. The, the, the conversation around um, the CIS controls made it a very real conversation, something that, that management could, could dig into. Um, it, it resonated with them. So uh, that, that part of the message has, uh, or the benefit has just, it has not gone away. It just, it just strengthens now, you know, with the opportunity to have a, a, a more, you know, even more prioritization, more simplification, so that we can, you know, explain our audit process, but to, again, to have these, these great engaged conversations with management. Very good, thank you. Um, Kelly, um, so what complementary uh, products or content do you think uh, CIS should uh, develop to further support the CIS controls? Well, I think with the community we have going now, the opportunity to use practice aids and tools that we can share with each other. We're, we have organizations that are small, medium sized. We have organizations that are huge. So the ability to say, I found this great tool, I have a scorecard, some of the things we're seeing is uh, some uh, renewed attention from vendors. There's a couple great GRC tools. Uh, we've got Archer, we've got ServiceNow who are really taking, uh, paying attention to the controls and saying, yeah, we want that in our dashboard and we want a specific dashboard to focus on these. And I, I also think another thing is um, not being afraid to share lessons learned. We have an opportunity to talk to different organizations and they'll say, you know, some of these controls are really hard and they don't want to sound whiny, but at least to hear other organizations say, yeah, I had a hard time understanding really what was in my inventory too. You, you kind of feel like you're, you're part of a team and, and you're working towards something a little better. Thanks. So Chris, um, how can organizations integrate the controls into their organizational risk management process? Yeah. Uh, the, the a good question, and the first thing people need to do is really figure out what they mean by risk, right? Uh, and this has been something that's been sort of vexing for organizations. What, what do we use for risk? There are a lot of risk uh, assessment standards and guidelines out there. And what we, uh, what we try to do is help people think through uh, what, is the, what is the likelihood of an impact and what could that impact be, but having a systematic way to, to, to think that through and to have a consistent way to think it through. Uh, not just to think about the impact to your organization, but the impact to others. We're, we're, when we're working with systems and information, we can hurt others, right? So we have to think about what could hurt us, what could hurt others, do that systematically. But if we also do it in a way where we realize that the risk is not just about the kind of harm that can come from a system or, uh, uh, or a hacker or a malware or data being leaked, uh, there's a lot of harm that can come from regulators a lot of harm that can come from judges and juries, a lot of harm that can come from executives. And what we mean by that is that uh, we, we have to figure out, are the safeguards that we're applying provably in balance with the risk that we're trying to protect against? So that's, when we talk about risk analysis, we want to be sure that people have a consistent way to, to think through what could happen to multiple parties, including ourselves, and are our safeguards in balance. What we liked about the CIS controls is you start by saying, let's look at the, let's look at the, the, the basic and the fundamental issues that are going to be really important uh, to, uh, to addressing those issues that we know to be common causes. And then uh, further risk analysis, which we'll be able to talk about in a little bit more, uh, just gets you to figure out how to make that fit in your organization to your particular risk. Perfect, thank you. And Tony, um, this uh, question always comes up about uh, the CIS controls in the context of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Perfect. So, you know, uh, the question for you is, you know, can you describe how the controls help um, complement um, an organizational, uh, organization's effort to implement the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework mm -hmm. um, or other regulatory uh, requirements? Sure. Yeah, the, um, you know, CIS has always been uh, directly involved with and supportive of the development of the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? And it's the closest thing we have to what we'll call a universal language at a, at a high level of risk, uh, you know, in terms of the functions and categories and a consistent way to describe that problem. But it, was, it wasn't designed as an implementation framework, right? So it, it then points to things like the CIS controls, like ISO, like the FISMA catalog, et cetera, as a way to get a handle on the specific action items that you should, you should take. 
So uh, that, that's a sensible way, you know, kind of makes sense with the NIST charter and it's a way to sort of hand off the, 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 the business of prioritization and actions to something that's already developed and already common in the industry. And that was by design from the NIST framework. So we're part of that. Uh, we map, of course, uh, we're within the NIST uh, documentation as one of the informative references. We map back to it. So we can tell anyone who adopts our work, you know, here's how to present yourself in terms of the NIST framework. And lots of other frameworks do that also. In fact, we don't speak of CIS controls as a framework at all. Right? We're really more of like a priority scheme or a management uh, scheme. You know, how, do I, how do I assign action items? What's my most important thing to do, as, as Greg noted? Uh, that is intended to be consistent with all these. I mentioned earlier, and we've done surveys uh, jointly with some companies, and many of you are living this now, right? this multi-framework era. So if we accept that, uh, you know, everyone wants to look over your shoulder to see if you're doing the right thing, right? Well, at CIS, we could argue, well, we're the best right thing there is out there, and so <laughs> pay attention to us. Or we can acknowledge that our adopters have to live in this world. So we're very focused on how do we make it easy for them to use our work, yet report it, you know, in like the world that Greg lives, or to the legal system, you know, the way Chris talks about it, or to in the NIST framework, right? If your management believes that that's the right way to, to have that conversation with key partners about risk, then we want to help our adopters make that as easy as possible, right? So that means, by agreement, we have to say then we have to be able to speak the right language. Mm -hmm. And part of our language simplification was to use consistent terms, particularly from NIST, wherever possible, and to be able to present our work in those terms. So you know, again, this, this whole like, notion of a prove to others I've done the right thing, I think is really a driving theme for the future of this business. And uh, you know, we believe strongly at CIS in peaceful coexistence, right? We're gonna support our adopters, make it easy for them to do these things. And so you know, we have an agreement with NIST, for example, in the future that uh, you know, this is a, a handshake agreement at this stage, all of our information will be cross-referenced between the other, right? There'll be an authoritative statement between us that says, when you do this in the controls, that's what it means in the NIST framework, this is what means the FISMA and back again. And that way, no one has to dream this up on their own, right? There's no individual convincing an individual order this is the right thing. This is what we say is the right thing. So that's kind of a statement of our philosophy uh, relative to NIST, but also these other frameworks. Yeah. So bottom line is we really have a strong partnership with, uh, with NIST, uh, and, and there is a complement between what we're doing with the, uh, uh, the CIS controls and also with the NIST cybersecurity framework and also with 853 for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask one more question um, since you guys were so brief and succinct with the, <laughs> with the first question. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, the questions will go to Kelly. Um, and in your opinion, what is the most uh, common pitfall you see organizations taking when trying to implement the control? Well, Kurt, there's a couple things we've been seeing. The first one is uh, not making it a community-wide or company-wide effort. And a lot of times we see some very earnest, hardworking, IT folks, compliance folks who believe in the controls and they spend hours and hours putting together ideas, plans, talk to other technical people and they don't go and they talk to the executive team or they don't go and talk to other departments. And I, I feel kind of bad, I feel sad that, that they're doing all this fabulous work and we really try and encourage people to set up a committee and get other departments involved. Because believe it or not, if an organization implements the controls, there are fabulous benefits to other departments. Human Resources now has a better idea of what employees are, where they're working, what they're using. Um, probably we can clean up payroll systems, insurance systems by sort of knowing what's in our inventory, where devices are located, where people are working for the day, especially in this sort of virtualized world we work in. And, and so we really encourage people to set up a committee and have a charter. To, um, it, you probably have a project management office in your organization. You probably have uh, a project manager. Um, become friends with them. They can help make life a whole lot easier. They know how to set up work breakdown structures, set up charters, set up a plan that will sort of kind of ease into the controls and also spread communications about the good work that's happening. The other thing we've seen organizations do is uh, because it's a prioritized list, they start with number one and they say, well, we're not gonna do anything until number one is 80% complete or 90, 100% complete. We are encouraging organizations, first of all, to read through all the controls. Not, if you're a, a workstation member, 
read the networking stuff. If you're a data classification specialist, look at uh, the inventory information and sort of understand the whole uh, overview of the controls, but then get together within your departments and break up the controls. There's no, just because it's a prioritized list doesn't mean you can't have multiple work efforts happening at the same time. We've had some customers say, boy, this is taking forever. And we said, well, why can't you give um, controls uh, you know, 15 and 16 over to your networking group? Or um, why can't uh, you sort of segment this off and segment that off? They're like, well, but you said it was prioritized. It, it is prioritized in importance, but you can have multiple priorities. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, um, so we've talked about this concept of um, do care. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we talked about you know risk assessment, um, risk assessment me methodologies. Maybe put it put it together uh, from not only a HALOC but also from uh, um, um, a good partner we have, Hovel uh, Hovel uh, levels, right. levels yeah. as well as from a CIS perspective. Yeah, yeah, good. So, uh, so uh, I'll say that HALOC has done information security work, but we're we're generally keeping like, like a lot of practitioners do keeping an eye on what is down the road. What, what do we expect will happen, positive, negative, what have you. And one of the things that we know when helping people with working with regulators is that a regulator will eventually come into an organization and will have a checklist of things to ask. And if the, if, if the, if the organization doesn't know how to answer the question the way the regulator is prepared to ask the question, <laughs> then they're going to be told by the regulator what to do in their organization. Well, you know, you're a bank, so other banks are doing this, so do exactly what these other banks are doing. Or you're a grocer, so do all these things that the grocers do. And, uh, and that puts the organization in a really bad spot. This is part of what I meant by saying, you know, think about the bad thing that could happen, and sometimes it's a visit from a regulator. It isn't because <laughs> regulators will get you in trouble, it's that they'll tell you what to do, and they might not know exactly how you function. That's why you see risk analysis in so many standards and requirements and why it's, it's so Im important to the cybersecurity framework. And then we've done litigation support where a judge will, I don't know if, if you've been involved in, in situations like this um, during litigation when one party is suing another, the judge will have two experts and they sort of fight it out in front of the judge. Now the judge and the attorney is present don't know what the experts are saying. They just know that they're saying things against each other <laughs> according to the role that they serve. And one of the best things you can do in a situation like that is turn to, the, turn to the judge and say, you know, you've got this thing that you call a duty of care balance test or a multi-factor balance test. And it has the following factors. And then you describe what the factors are and you know what it is? It's a risk assessment. Did they foresee the threat? Did they think about the likelihood? Did they think about the impact? Did they think about alternative safeguards? Did they think about how the safeguards were going to not just protect the system, but were the safeguards providing a, a, what they call a reasonable burden? Were the safeguards more burdensome than the risk you're trying to protect? And if you've got a systematic way to describe that, and, and all of a sudden the nerd just takes the sword away from their opponent nerd by, <laughs> by saying to the judge, you've got a duty of care balance test. We do too, it's called a risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And the risk assessment looks like this, and we've been able to demonstrate due care. But the phrase due care meaning that you were able to demonstrate that the likelihood and the impact of, a, of, of, of the threat that you were foreseeing and you were thinking about the CIS control for inventory, there are some things I'm just not gonna be able to keep track of. Let's say in a, in, a, in a cloud environment where servers come up and down and you can't keep track of them. What is the likelihood and the impact of a threat that I'm concerned about? Well, Your Honor, I took a look at that. Or Dear Regulator, I took a look. Dear Regulator works, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Regulator, uh, I, I thought about the likelihood and the impact of that. I used the same criteria for that analysis that I used for every other threat I thought about what was gonna be acceptable and not acceptable to the public and to us. I looked at the way I would apply the CIS control, and I evaluated the CIS control the same way I applied my risk. And I checked to see if they were in balance. And if they're in balance, I got reasonable and appropriate. We've seen that conversation work over and over and over again in regulatory issues, uh, in, uh, in litigation. We've seen it work in the boardroom a lot. Because when you're doing that, you're saying, Hey, by the way, board, I'm not telling you I need a lot of money because DLP is basically regular expression evaluation of packets that go through an unencrypted network. No, I said the likelihood and the impact of a data breach through our firewall is un intolerably high, but the cost of the DLP is way lower than the impact we could create. Oh, okay, yeah, we'll put that in your budget. That's a much better conversation to have, right? So we were very interested in, in working with CIS because uh, 
I'm sure we've all read a lot of security standards. Is there anything better to read than the CIS controls? You know what you're being advised to do. It's really understandable. And if you're gonna show someone risk analysis, and we've been working with, uh, with CIS to develop a risk assessment method, it has to be, it has to be very specific and guideline-y and a lot of examples and a lot of, uh, a lot of instruction, very basic just the way we see the CIS controls written so that they're intelligible to the audience. So cat out of the bag, we've got CIS RAM coming out soon, a risk assessment method uh, that CIS is, is working on that tells you exactly how you do that risk analysis uh, uh, using the CIS controls so that if things can't exactly work the way you need them to it, by applying a control to an asset, you've got a way to at least analyze the risk and determine whether, it, whether or not what you're ending up with is safe. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Cody, um, in your opinion, uh, what do you think the importance of regularly updating the controls? We're now on version seven. <laughs> regularly updating, well, it's hard to tell what regular is. You know, the, when, this, uh, when we really started to, I'll call it formalize or institutionalize this project, I always thought of it as we're, we're trying to walk a line here, right? Everyone was, says they're aiming for the sweet spot. Here's the sweet spot we're aiming for. Um, you know, you can make yourself crazy by trying to keep up with the threat of the day, actually the threat of the hour, the threat of the minute, right? You're flooded with alerts, bulletins, advisories, uh, IOCs, and so forth. And that is just overwhelming. It doesn't help you. You know, people believe that, boy, if the government would just tell me what it knows, I could defend myself, or I just bought the right threat feed, I'd be okay. It's just a miss. You know, there, you would overwhelm your defenders, right, who are already working almost nonstop to defend yourself. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, sort of large scale frameworks, right, by design. They're carefully thought through, every edge case is considered, years to develop, you know, formal processes to get public comment, you know, kind of a, at the other end of the spectrum. And frameworks or any of these documents range from the sort of cosmic, you know, do good and write me a paper that says you did good to, you know, buy this thing and put this thing in, everything in between. So we've always aimed at um, the sweet spot of um, current enough, right? And current in contr CIS controls words is about attacks. The thing that Kurt and I share, you know, we, we are lifelong defenders who've spent our lives inside an intelligence agency. And that's a great education. <laughs> uh, occasionally painful education. But to understand, live with, be part of, cross-train people in attack and defense. And that's what drives us the way we think about the control. So it's about making sense of millions and millions of data points of badness, right? Attacks. IOCs and so forth. At the end of the day, it's not about sharing all that. It's about translating that into the action, into action in your enterprise. What are you going to do about it? How do I take millions of negative things, translate it into a relatively small number of positive, constructive things I can do, convince the boss it's worth doing, right? Make a case for, purchase, train, etc. And so that's really the work of both the CIS benchmarks and the CIS controls. It's not the sharing, it's the translation, right? Think of that as the key verb in your life. Do you have enough people in your enterprise to do that on your own? With the right skill, with the right feed? I guarantee you not, except for a few exceptions in this business. That's a job where I, look, I looked at that and go, you know what, we share that problem. Why don't we share the labor to figure out what that translation ought to look like at the 80, 90% level? That's really what the controls are about, right? And, and again, benchmarks by extension. How do we help people, in effect, we don't use the term, but how do we crowdsource that activity and make that translation there? So that part of it, now, you, so you cannot do that every day, and you can't do it every week, and probably not every month, but you can't wait for years either, right? So part of our exercise, both with the staff at CIS and with our volunteers, is you know, we're close with folks like the Verizon Data Breach folks and the people who do the Semantic Annual Report and the Palo Alto and all these great companies, right? They have massive sensor networks, massive amounts of data, and many of them publish it, right? They give it to you every year for free. I still can't get over that, right? Why would they do that? It's marketing stuff for them. I'm, not, I'm an old government guy. We think, oh my gosh, how much, would it, how much would it cost us to do that analysis, write a beautiful document with charts and so forth and publish? Well, people do that as to prove that they know more about the, the problem than their competitor, right? So they're willing to give it to you for free. I look at that and go, what can we do with that? And so we approached you know, all those kinds of companies, not to get all their data, but to look at the summary, the trend, the pattern of attack they're seeing, the templates. Because as defenders, right, it's great to read those reports. They're really interesting, exciting. Occasionally, like, oh my gosh, that could have been me, or maybe that was you. 
But the reason you would spend your time as a defender to read them is to translate them into action. That's the bottom line. So why don't we do that as a group? That's the way we think about problem making. So translating that, uh, so we have to have some currency, right? And we track this stuff very regularly and we talk to those companies fairly regularly. Uh, but so the pace of update then is uh, never been fixed, right? This has turned out to be two and a half years, I think it is. Uh, as, as James mentioned, you know, there aren't radical changes for the last couple rounds of the controls, right? Guess what? There haven't been radical changes in attack methods either, right? There's millions of repeats of the same thing over and over again because they work. There are different targets. There are different objectives like ransomware, denial of service. You know, you see these things come and go, uh, theft of intellectual property. But if you look at the patterns of attack, you're not seeing dramatic changes month by month, even year by year, right? So the key is, and Kurt hinted at this, can we collectively, right, if we can't build perfect defense, and history says we cannot, then our goal is to understand the sort of classes of attacks, the vast majority of things, and as defenders make rational, responsible choices, as Kurt, uh, Chris hinted, about where can I spend my money and my scarce people time and my management attention, right? And I can't do it at one layer, I gotta do it more than one. But I can't do it at every layer, and I do not have an infinite budget. So I've gotta have a rational way to make this translation from, from knowledge about attacks into defenses. So that is really kind of the philosophy that underlies our best practice work at CIS. Right? And so what has turned out to be, you know, a couple years is sort of about right. Uh, some things do change in our world, right? Uh, the technology of business, right? The way businesses have used technology, uh, the, the demands of the business on technology, the complexity of connections, uh, the uh, instantiations like the cloud and you know, so forth uh, have really changed a lot of uh, the sort of underlying mechanisms and we have to keep rethinking because of that. But it's not attacks themselves, you know, I, we feel like we have a pretty good handle on and we track them and that's really what represents the major contribution that we, we have here. Good. So perfect. So two, key, two uh, yeah, takeaways from that, offense informs defense. Right, and uh, the second piece is really around a set of uh, prioritized actions because um, uh, when you when you balance offense and defense, typically defense is not as well resourced as offense, and so uh, at least now we have a set of prioritized actions for that. So the final question uh, goes to Greg um, before we uh, open it up to the uh, audience, and, and that really is around you know what key advice do you have to give to uh, an organization embarking on implementing the controls for the first time? Well, good. Um, let me start by thanking you for asking me the first question because typically the auditor doesn't get asked the first question in a, in a panel. Um, so I'm much, much more comfortable answering the, the last question, as it were. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think the people sitting in this room are, are, are people that are very well, well versed in, in how this goes. But, you know, I'd go back to, to how the, the original consensus audit guidelines were developed. It, it really gets down to, to getting the right people in the room. And uh, I'm not talking about you know, 50 people, but uh, six to 10 people, and uh, literally go through the controls in a very judgmental, uh, intuitive kind of way. How do we think as an organization we're doing with this? And just kind of you know, gather perspectives that way. Um, it, it will give you very quickly a heat map on where you ought to be applying emphasis. So that, that, that's really how I'd get started. Okay, um, Phil, Robin, um, questions uh, from the audience or from uh, remote, several? So, yeah, actually we'll start with over here. Yep, maybe, um, please go ahead, sir. There you go. Bring me the mic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is John Holmblad, and I have a question about the control that pertains to fundamentally software development, because we all know mm -hmm. that if you can solve the problems in software development, then all these other things kind of go away. Um, and I'm aware of some work that was done by uh, a group uh, called Sigital, and Gary McGraw mm -hmm. developed a model called Building in Security Maturity Model. And I'm wondering how that uh, dovetails with what you're uh, recommending with respect to contr the control that pertains to software I'll development. Yeah, I'll be glad to talk about Yeah, please, Tony. Yeah, the, uh, the, you know, the, the um, original model, the basic model of the CIS controls has really been about operational practice. Right, what things can we do in terms of technology and processes and training and so forth in our environment to manage this problem. But there's a, still a root cause issue here, right? The flaws in software, for example. 
support architectures. I mean, there's some more complicated sort of foundational problems that often uh, force you to try and deal with them in the operational environment, right? So managing certain things could be made a lot easier if we didn't have, we didn't have to worry so much about zero days of software, for example. So vSIM, one of the things we did uh, starting a couple versions ago, uh, my goal has been to keep the CIS controls sort of tightly focused and uh, again, don't, don't boil the ocean, don't try to solve world hunger, don't, don't create a thousand uh, item action list here. So we made a, a decision a couple uh, versions ago to say, uh, you know, there are other groups, particularly nonprofit groups or sort of associations that have looked at some of these problems in more detail. And so for versions of six and seven, we are uh, doing much more work in reaching out to these other groups to point to them as opposed to try and recreate what they've done within the control. So, You'll, you'll see specific references to the work of OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, uh, Safe Code, uh, BSEM. We did not put in there for a number of reasons. I'll be happy to talk about. But there's some great work. You know, I know, I know that some of the principles. Uh, that what we are doing is actively within the control, saying, you know, we really know software development is important. We're not going to solve that problem within the kind of model that we have of the control. What we'll do instead is we'll talk about what we think are a few key, critical, uh, important things to deal with within the controls and then point to others. And uh, when I say point to others, that means uh, we, our discussions are about synchronizing the release of products, maybe issuing joint statements about the role of software development in this case relative to the controls, uh, about the, the sort of uh, uh, connection point between better software and the management and configuration of better you know, software that we can address more directly in the controls. So we're looking for those kinds of things, to tr again, to try and not recreate great work that's being done by other nonprofits or other independent groups. So if you have a favorite, and again, we have, I'll be glad to discuss any of them with you, uh, we are looking for those kinds of things. Again, that allows us to focus our community really where it needs to be, but also acknowledge great work that's happening elsewhere. You know, this is really, again, a, an ecosystem problem, right? It's not about us having the best list. It's about how do we help people uh, achieve the really good intentions behind these lists. Uh, hi, my name is Jason. Um, I have a, a team of folks that are, are working in a, a five-state area in the south um, doing, uh, applying CIS for a, uh, a cell link, uh, for link, uh, for a telecom. Okay. Um, and one of the things that they're concerned about with, with V7 um, is uh, mapping uh, from V6 to V7, specifically, um, as, as uh, uh, James had mentioned, you guys are, are I think the phrase that was used was, spirit of the control is the same. So I write questions for assessments for energy companies and insurance companies. That's what I do for a living. One of the things that I pay a lot of attention to is uh, a, a phrase called scope expanding conjunctions, right? So hey, I love that. It's, yeah, so it, it, one of my principles of writing a question is it can't be a scope expand, can't contain a scope expanding conjunction. Okay. My question for this specifically is, um, through that simplification process, are, is there an inverse to scope expanding conjunctions for your control mapping where the, uh, the control might have uh, simplified down um, and left something out? And secondly, one of the things that I look at when we look at uh, uh, rewriting a question, in your case a control, right. um, is context shifting. So um, when you create a control, and I know there's 20, but then there's the underlying 149 mm -hmm. that are there. In that simplification, is there any context shifting that would have happened? So not context versus non-context changing of a control uh, that would then uh, uh, change the spirit of the control through that simplification that would then cause us to have to go back to hundreds of assessments and remap or realign. Yeah, part of the question. Actually, the maybe the yeah, best. Phil, <laughs> but I'll tell you the uh, the intent was one thing we did this time, and Phil can speak to it. We create a much better um, uh, change log, we call it, but a mapping of what was in version seven. I mean, and what the discussion was, what was changed, uh, where it went, you know, what was deleted, what was added. I mean, down to pretty pretty fine detail. So that was intended, to, and that will be part of the the release of the uh, version seven to make it. Uh, easy to move to these other things. We, I, 
um, I'm not sure I can answer the context question. I will say that we, what we found was, uh, we got a lot of feedback that said, uh, this is an a, a interesting subcontrol, but you're really asking for three different things. Yeah. And one of them's easy, one of them's hard, and one's impossible, or you know, something like that. And, uh, and I'd measure one this way and another that way. So the real goal was, this, uh, you know, what I gave to the group was a philosophy of one ask per, per subcontrol. So we attempted not to lose any meaning unless we intended to, right? So you'll see that, I think, in, in any change log item. But the idea was to make that as, as straightforward as possible. Now again, for right now, that is found in basically an Excel spreadsheet, right? So it's kind of a manual mapping to this. We're looking at, I'll say, more exciting possibilities uh, for the future where that is really uh, available to you in technology. So if you have like a workflow management tool that you, where you make these assignments, you'll be able to push in the changes. But anything else, Phil, from the change record uh, point yeah, of view? So absolutely, right now, since you mentioned telling the, the change log that we're releasing, if you're interested in excruciating details, <laughs> you can hop on a workbench in the community and every single change is recorded for each subcontrol. So in terms of the, the scope, and the, well, this is one of the big principles when we were re-examining simplifying the language is to make sure there wasn't significant changes to the scope unless it was intended. Um, and that comes with clarifying assets, systems, hardware devices. Um, so as part of being more consistent with our language, I think we've really firmed up what the scope is for the controls. So reading the scope can be a formal email. Yeah. <laughs> it's, we, we hope. Yeah, yeah. depending. We think. Um, and you know, we're, we're available to kind of help you know, with that information. If the change log doesn't provide sufficient detail, you know, we're happy to kind of work through and figure out what detail do you really need for, uh, yeah. for your A big changes. under the hood issue, which Phil mentioned, right? We, 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 we run this discussion, and I'd be embarrassed to tell you how primitive our previous discussions were managed in my email queue, you know, on a Word document, but uh, the, the, we, we, we are now, uh, within CIS, have this uh, in-house platform that we call Workbench, right, which is open to people to, to join. It allows us to both manage the discussion uh, manage the creation of a document, but also recreate the discussion about every point that was made. If you attempted to do that in email, you, you know, you're getting messages constantly that you're over your email limit from the system. So you, we needed a way to be able to recreate the discussion sort of in a low cost way. So we can always go back to look at what, what we said. Because I, I'm convinced, by the way, we don't do it this way, but you know, the discussions are really the fascinating part. Why do we say you ought to do this? Well, because I'm aware of a particular type of attack that if I knew that uh, this was a configuration setting in this part of the system, you know, this could be part of a five-step process to allow me to, you know, that stuff is gold, right? It's hard to capture, but if I'm a systems engineer trying to design solutions, I want every detail so that I can decide, should I worry about that either here or some other place in the system? So, so, so it's a great question. We attempted um, in a much better detail this time to help manage the transition. We don't expect everyone to sort of overnight change, by the way, right? Lots of people have built workflow tools and so forth around them. That's great. But uh, we wanted to make it easy for those that were going to transition. So Tom, just have a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Can I add Did one you? thing to that? Mm -hmm. There were there some impl implications in the controls before. Uh, one of the big discussion points I remember us having is uh, we talked about unauthorized and authorized machine that's, uh, yeah. assets, assets, devices, that whole conversation. And we never really said, are you aware of unauthorized devices? So we, we went through, and things that were sort of assumed, we very yeah. plainly <laughs> said, hey, of course you're going to look at authorized, but you need to also have an inventory of unauthorized, right. as Great. strange as that sounds. Um, one that sticks out in my head, maybe a scope increase, is on um, uh, NTP servers. We upped it from two to three based on some of the stories we've been seeing on the attacks on uh, Tick and Talk. That, that's one I know is a scope increase. Uh, is there anything? Well, that would be a scope increase. That would be a context change. Right? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, you're correct. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that, th it, somebody else has another idea. Those are the two that kind of popped up in my head. Okay. And I'm kind of thinking of your question as well because, uh, you know, we've got some, some remapping or redoing, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, within our own assurance frameworks. That work's got to be done, but uh, the hope is that we ultimately have a more concise uh, assurance map and, and uh, mm -hmm. m maybe even less to do, but we're really focusing on, on the good stuff because um, I think over time, uh, you know, some of the controls, the way that they were written, did introduce some, some ambiguity on, on how you would measure it, how you would, would assess it. So I think we're moving in the right direction, but it's still no fun to have to kind of start from zero and go, okay, how, how does this work in the, in the new version? 
all volunteer. Um, I have to go through the in, in terms of spoken context changes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll probably do that this weekend, next weekend. Um, so I'll, I'll we can get connect with Phil. We can actually get you involved directly yeah. in our yeah. work bench. Bench, work bench to, to be part of that. Absolutely. Good. Maybe um, internet question. Certainly. So we got one question regarding um, what improvements did not make it in version seven. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to jump on this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you asked the question? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, though. Questions from Phil. So the one thing that we really wanted to include, but we weren't able to, is identifying prioritization for the specific subcontrols. Yep. And that's something we'll be working diligently in the next few months or weeks. I don't know. I don't know. It depends what Kurt gives us a timeline. Um, two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. <laughs> two weeks. To, to work on and really identify, um, you know, kind of the, the 6.1 the advance of foundational or some form of prioritization Great scheme point. to help organizations um, really kind of set their direction for the controls. And that's one thing that we're really going to work on in terms of developing. And there's a lot of additional companion guides where we're looking and we have in queue. So ideas are absolutely always welcomed. Also, if you're interested in contributing, that's also very welcomed as well. So those are kind of the exactly, two yeah. things we're thinking of including. That's a great point. We, we're, we're, we're you know, now having made it to this point with the release of version 7. We have a very long list of things that we'd like to do, could do, people have asked us to do, so please jump into that. Uh, we'll, you know, we're right now sort of making the roadmap for what these things will be. Phil, I have one thing. We, I think we might be the only organization not talking about machine learning and AI right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> okay, so um, any other questions from, on the floor? Seeing none, any more from uh, online? Yep. Keep this one. Yeah. Uh, Chris had a really easy question. When is SysRAM going to be released? Yeah, Chris? I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the uh, yeah. By the way, CISRAM, uh, uh, the, the CIS risk assessment method, uh, uh, we're we're anticipating about two weeks or so to have a launch event, uh, a, a, a web-based launch event, uh, and uh, the, the documents are prepared. We're ready to go. Uh, there's a nice framework uh, document as well, a, a sort of a workbook that all the templates and exercises you can do in the thing to get good practice. We're expecting about two weeks or so. So uh, uh, keep your eye on the interwebs. There will be announcements. Yep, so anyone who's on the CIS mailing list, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, publicizing this shortly. Yeah. Yes, thank yep. you. So a key theme here is two weeks. Everything will be delivered in two, <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks, that's right. In that. cycle. But oh my goodness. What we didn't want to do, we didn't want to take away from the importance of the version seven launch, uh, but we, you know, we're gonna follow this with a, hopefully a, a webinar within two weeks based off um, the launch of the uh, CIS uh, risk, assess uh, risk assessment uh, methodology for that, so. So we have another question of uh, everyone's favorite topic, uh, mappings to the controls. So I guess, uh, what are we planning or what are the plans for CIS or whoever helps develop the mappings to kind of support them in the future? Yeah, well, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. Well, uh, well, it, you know, so even though it's March Madness, we have been working on the mappings. Um, you know, watching your brackets or the brackets? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this right. A little bowl. Um, uh, James and I have been working on the mappings for a while. They are updated for Controls Version Seven um, on our AuditScripts.com website. Uh, the other nice thing, I know we didn't really have a chance to talk about it. In the, uh, the release of the controls, the entity diagrams have also been updated for version 7. So if you're trying to see how dif different systems can help you implement the controls, uh, I have found those entity diagrams to be so incredibly helpful. So that's another thing okay. I'm excited about. Yep, so uh, CIS will come out with a sort of a branded mapping to all these different frameworks. I mean, again, we are, you know, we, we're conscious of our role in this overall ecosystem, right? And conscious of this problem of everyone has to deal with these different frameworks. So we are fully committed to making that as easy for you as possible. So right now, again, the, the sort of form of that are these uh, Excel spreadsheets, you know, sort of manually created, mapped, you know, there's a lot of work behind the scenes to make these things useful. Uh, any ideas you have, we have had some very exciting ideas come into our inbox now for people who want to help us do that in a much more automated, much more powerful way. So you'll see some changes in that pretty, not within two weeks, but <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Okay, so we're sli uh, slightly over time, but we have time for one more question. Yep. 
go to one other question. Uh, so we have the big cybersecurity industry conference coming up in April, RSA. Right. And I'm just wondering to what extent are the suppliers in, that in, in the industry um, fully aware of what the CIS is doing and where they fit in to this control framework that you've established? Uh, do you want to do that? Uh, oh, you go ahead and start. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the you know, the, the CIS controls have been embraced very broadly across the industry, okay, and the, the CIS benchmarks also. So there's sort of a membership model, right, that allows us, or that permits us to uh, interact with these companies. Um, many of them have individuals who are part of our volunteer community, right, so they decide to participate. So they're part of the events, the scheduling, the content creation, and so forth here. I think you'll see, um, you know, so, so you can go to any number of the, especially the big companies in this industry and get uh, support or measurement against the CIS benchmark or uh, uh, CIS controls. I, I'd say we're, over the last year to two years, we've been seeing an emergence of different types of tools really aimed at the controls and around the broader risk assessment problem. Um, uh, Kelly mentioned the, the uh, rising interest by GRC type vendors. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of sort of standalone, I'll call them risk assessment tools that have come in uh, some of them are sort of, um, you know, uh, based on a mix of uh, either survey data or technical measurements that they pull from tools that you might already own or, or custom tools. So there's very broad acceptance by the marketplace in this. I'm not quite sure, you know, we're, we're talking to all these vendors now about uh, meetings and things that they're going to release at RSA or references that they make. Many of them have posted white papers that talk about how their product line maps to version 6. And I'm sure all those will be updated sometime in the next few weeks or, or maybe a little bit longer than that. So uh, if you stay, again, if you're on the CIS mailing list, you, whenever, one thing we can do now that we could not do very well when we, you know, sort of prior to version six, we actually have a pretty good handle on all this kind of stuff. And we're writing use cases, you know, we get adopter cases from, from folks who are willing to answer questions. We survey people who download the controls. Uh, we're much tighter bound to the vendors than we ever were in the past. So you can kind of keep a, keep a handle on that just by staying in touch with CIS through our, our normal means. Yep, and uh, I would just add to that, uh, and I think um, James uh, talked to it in, in, in his opening remarks, really was around that uh, a measurement per control uh, aspect of that. And so now we want to be able to get that and automate that, uh, that process as well. And so we're, we're, we're talking with a number of um, security vendors on, on just how to, how to um, do the implementation for that. But, uh, Tony's absolutely right. Uh, it's we've seen remarkable growth in, in uh, control-specific uh, tools. Um, you know that are uh, components of tools uh, and he helping in that measurement for that. So, okay. Um, so I think I would like to thank the panel uh, for your uh, expert and very succinct uh, answers to that. And uh, then we're gonna, I'm going to have Tony come back up for uh, some sure. closing remarks. <laughs> Okay, I'll keep the uh, closing here brief. Uh, as Kurt knows it, that's not my nature, so um, bear with me. We have contact information up here for uh, CIS. And again, you're welcome to both uh, be consumers of what we produce, but also uh, creators of what we produce. Now, I often tell people, uh, again, there's no mystery think tank that is CIS, right? It's, we are, are a, um, a mechanism to bring together the talent and goodwill that's found in abundance in across this industry here and to recognize that we have a common problem and we have to do th some things together. One of the most satisfying things that happens to me, and this happens very regularly, so Chris talked about uh, CISRAM, right? Where uh, great companies in this industry, or great individuals, literally bump into me at a conference, show up on my doorstep, say, we love what you're doing, and we want to contribute this to the cause. My gosh, That's, that, that is just an overwhelmingly positive thing, and to me, it, it gives us a great responsibility from CIS to do right by that, right? To take these great ideas, tools that people have, content that they're creating, that they're willing to give to the common good, that we can then take, generalize, bring in other volunteers, and create and sustain. Remember, sustainment is really an important part of all this uh, improvement in cybersecurity. So we really uh, treasure the role that CIS plays, and we're very conscious of the responsibility that comes with that. So, th so thanks to all that contribute to that. And again, with, a, with an email, you can be part of the uh, inside family and contribute what you bring to the table. And as uh, Phil said, you know, we are, we are uh, all about bringing these ideas together, creating things out of them. So thanks, thanks so much. This has been an amazing ride, as I said, from a handful of friends to really a worldwide movement, right? A whole set of activities that cuts across the entire industry. Uh, for folks like me and Kurt and others of us who have prior government service in CIS, 
Uh, this is an amazingly satisfying way to have a kind of a second act, a second career, right? To take uh, the, the knowledge, the experience that was paid for, frankly, with your taxpayer dollars and translate it into action for the community at large. So thank you all very much for spending uh, time with us today. Thank you. Thank you.